You've ventured into the depths of cyberspace, where the peculiar and the mundane collide in the vast expanse of the digital void. A YouTube video beckons, promising a glimpse into the world of obscure fascination, though your interest wanes like a flickering candle in the wind. While waiting for the narrator to stop talking, you have a couple drinks and start making out with a woman with a face as flat and as pointy as a tenrec in a waffle press. But when you pull her away, you realize that you just kissed her so hard you caved her face inwards, and when you check around to the back of her head, the back of her head has your face in it, and it turns out you were just kissing one of those stupid nail toy things. Because you're stupid and you're a drunk and nobody likes you, and you forgot to mail your parents a Christmas card, except it's Mayday. Mayday, the plane is crashing, you look out to the wing and see nothing interesting in particular, but your in-flight movie this evening happens to be The Star Zone. Tonight's story unfolds unlike any other in the annals of the mind. This, as you may recognize, is Strangetown, an isolated civilization nestled in the unforgiving embrace of the desert sands, a place where the bizarre and unexplainable hold sway over reality. Now picture if you can be bothered, stepping foot into this peculiar carnivation only to discover yourself as the solitary conscious mind among a township of automatons, uncaring or incapable of comprehending a world outside of their own daily routines. But beware, for admits the sea of indifference lurks one who sees through the facade, one who knows your essence and seeks to claim dominion over the realm of awareness itself. This is Sims 2 for the PSP. It's another f***ing Sims video. And I am back with another Sims video! As is to be expected, character creation comes first. I pretty much just made Joseph Seed from Far Cry 5 in an attempt to make myself, but... Fuck it, we ball. Get her done and hit- We're going back to Strangetown. In an intro quite similar to that of Sims 2 for the DS. Driving a dinged up old car through the desert. Then out of nowhere, an oddly light colored plum bob- Yeah, that's what those are called. You know, the crystals that usually show up above Sim you're controlling? Anyway. Flies in out of nowhere, chasing the car briefly like a heat-seeking missile before zipping off into the sky. And then my car starts dying. Did the plumb bob do it? We pull over into a conveniently close by mechanic shop, and he seems pissed off that I'm even here. And now we're off! Notice that there's no plumb bob above my head like there normally would be in other Sims games. Hmm. We talk to Oscar the mechanic and ask him to repair the car, and he starts talking about respect and claiming that he's the best mechanic. More so than that, an artist, like Michelangelo, who he thinks painted the Mona Lisa. He's upset that we want him, the mechanic, to fix a car for money, and we'd rather have a normal conversation first. Which takes place in the form of matching images and picking the topic which it represents. We're basically trying to reciprocate with the same conversation points, I think. So I chat to him for 5 seconds and he goes from hating my guts to believing wholeheartedly that we're best friends, even offering me a discount. But it's still going to take some time for him to fix the car, so he sends me to go speak to a woman called Mamba Loa in the gas station. Outside the shop we meet Deputy Duncan, who says I look lost. And this is where dialogue options in this game really begin to shine, because I have two options here. My car broke down, I'm just killing time till it's fixed. Honest, straightforward, non-hostile, boring. Or, yeah, well, you look stupid. Guess we've all got our own problems. Bold. Level-headed. Alpha. So naturally, I like to insult the first cop that I see. Watch it, you're in my town now. Got no need for big city troublemakers, he says, his lower teeth quivering in confusion. I've got no need for small town cops, so get fucked, I reply, left nut expanding in rage. He then just tells me to go away, and that's that for now. I then find a leftover model from Blinks to Time Sweeper that tells me to stop stalking women. So I go into the gas station shop and meet Mambo Loa, who insists on giving me a psychic personality reading by asking me a few questions. She starts off by asking why I'm here. I say I'm exploring. She asks what I do with a million bucks, and she doesn't give you any charitable options, so I tell her I'd just pull a Jim Carrey and quit my job in paint. What's my dream car? A limo, apparently. What if someone wrecked it? I'd eat ice cream. If I were an animal, what animal would I be? I'll be a wolf-lion wolf, hybrid mix. mix. King of the jungle, jungle but still oh, social, social and, and with it. it. What's the best way to say I love you? Flash them. She then tells me that I want to uncover the secrets of the universe. And that I'm a Scorpio. But I'm just like, nope, I want to be a Capricorn. And that, that's it. 
this whole thing is pointless. She then explains the goals system. Basically, these images on the left are things that I want to do at any given moment, and completing some of these keeps up my sanity meter, represented by my urinal piss crystal. And right now, one of my goals is to greet someone, so I introduce myself to the dolled up hobo sleeping in the gas station. She keeps saying that she doesn't have time for me, and that she has to leave, but she never does. A quick conversation and I discover a secret. She's running away because she was abducted by aliens. So it turns out that this woman is no regular gas station napper, but is in fact the enigmatic Bella Goth. Now, before I started making these Sims videos, I would have had no idea why that name is significant. But unfortunately, I've since had my third eye opened to the advanced, deep, Tolkien-esque lore of this franchise. So for those who don't know, Bella Goth is one of the most significant characters in the entire Sims franchise, as she is not only recurring, but has a huge mystery tied to her. Basically, she was married to this dude named Mortimer, and then she disappeared because she was, as it says here, abducted by aliens. But actually, she might have gone back in time as well, because her grave appears in Sims 3, which is set, for some reason, 25 years before Sims 1. It's a whole thing. Actually, in the comments of the last Sims video, you guys kept telling me to do a Sims lore video. So for the day I finally do that, I'm going to start collecting and archiving data at the end of every Sims video. Mambo Lower then explains the secret system. See, every sim has a few different secrets, including intimate ones gained by, well, being intimate, and deep, dark secrets gained by intimidating them. There are also a few different characters in the game who will buy secrets from you depending on what they're interested in. So, not even kidding, one of the best ways to get money in this game is to be a narc and gain people's trust by fucking them and then selling their secrets on the black market, like some kind of nosy gigolo. Can we get a 500? The secret of what a favorite ice cream is. 500, can we get a 500? Can we get a 500? 500 over there. 600 in the back, 600 in the back. 600 over there in the back. Can we get a 700 in the front? Can we get a 700 in the front? 700, 300, 300. Wait, what? That's not enough. 800, 800. Can we get an 800? Don the Don Lothario. Sold the Don Lothario. Is that an auction, guys? So I start flirting with Bella at godlike speed. So godlike, apparently, that we immediately have sex on the gas station floor, which gives us her intimate secret, that she married her husband for his money. After that, Bella grabs some morning after pills straight off the shelf and goes to the bathroom, while I get myself a paddle pop. Mambo number five tells me to go see if my car is done. So I go outside to go back to the garage, and... The entire building, the mechanic, and my car are gone without a trace. All that I can find is a ringing phone on the floor. I answer it to someone called Dr. Dominic Nulo, and he's like, Missing something? Let me offer you some help in the form of a job. Which, I have no choice but to accept for whatever it is. He tells me to hitch a ride into town and hangs up. So naturally I go to the cop and tell him what just happened, and he's like, Rip, get used to it, it's strange town, baby. So I ask him to give me a lift into town, and he's like, I'll do it if you intimidate Mambo and find where a secret stash of donuts are hidden. He can't do it himself, apparently, because they have history. Or he just doesn't have a search warrant. So now I have to intimidate the person who taught me about intimidation. I succeed at telling her I'll eat her teeth, and she tells me she hides her donuts in the bin in the bathroom like Walter White hiding that meth in the dunny. So I fish out the Krispy Kremes and give them the deputy... Oh, yeah, right, okay, yeah, you got it. His name's Duncan, he likes donuts. He, like, Duncan, du okay, I only just got that. Anyway, he then tells me that he can't take me into town until I found a place to stay while I'm there. So I tell Bella about this, and she tells me that she's actually trying to sell her house. Apparently the house is worth like a million dollars, but she wants to get out of here so bad that she sells the house to me for all the money I have, which is like not even 800. She even tells me it comes with a maid. So I report back to Dill Hole, and he finally takes me into Strangetown, where he tells me about all of my new neighbors. So, there's Isaac Rossum the inventor, Hazel Dente who's been for a few marriages, the Beakers who are scientists, and Dr. Nulo, the dude who called me earlier. So I throw him in the so I stroll in into my new home and... The maid screams bloody murder into my face. She apologizes for mistaking me for something else. Then she tells me that no one typically stays in this house for more than a week because of something. So I go inside my new massive house to look for the something and... Oh. Ah! What the fuck? So we've got actual fuck... It's back again! I'm about to die from insanity.
Leave me alone. What the fuck kind of fun us of Freddy's bullshit? We find that the place is haunted by some ghosts. The maid, Emily, informs us that the first ghost, Dennis, was the richest man in town when he was alive. And he was married to Hazel Dente. Until he was swimming one day when the lad had disappeared and he drowned. Which, if you don't know, is like the typical Sims experience. Everybody who's played The Sims has had someone get into the pool and then remove the ladder to make them drown. So, maybe Hazel didn't actually kill Dennis, but we did. The truth is, I may be more right than you think. Maybe. Alright, so what I need to do is find Dennis's remains so I can bury them and he can move on to hell or whatever Sims believe in. Speaking of burials, in the dead center of town is a circular cemetery, and Duncan tells me that if I want to earn any extra cash, I can pick up a shovel and prevent the dead people from getting out. This is what the cop has to do every day? Get the fuck back in the ground. Get the fuck back in there. Go back to hell where you came from. I go to make friends with this Scottish guy, and since I forget that you have to complete goals to stay sane, I fail and I'm actually institutionalized and put through a mental ward, and then I'm dumped back on my doorstep, $500 poorer. Simlish healthcare system. Then they prescribe me with watch TV, so I buy myself my own devil's dream box and watch some kitchen nightmares, and it completes one of the goals I have and raises my sanity temporarily. But it also makes me cry out of hunger, so I tell my maid to grill me a cheese. I eat it, standing up like a man, then immediately pass it, standing up like a man. Anyway, I was supposed to be looking for the ghost remains, so it's time I talk to his widowed wife, Hazel Dente. She immediately flirts with me in front of her new fiancé and asks if, since I own the big house, do I have a lot of money? I say no, and she's like, ah, oh, never mind then. Another gold digger. And apparently she feels bad for my broke ass, so now she wants to pay me to do some work around her house. She tells me to go talk to a new man's, but he's on the phone, so I wander around the house instead. And I immediately walk in on Hazel showering, but she doesn't seem to mind. While Hazel and her fiancé are always occupied, I pass the time by watching some Top Gear on the TV. <laughs> now that I'm a certified mechanic, I crack open their pool filter and find the shredded swimsuit of Dennis. So I take it back to Emily, and now she starts flirting with me, despite holding a dead man's budgie smugglers. And then she tells me to bury them in Hazel's yard so the dude can move on to the afterlife. I go to take the cozies back to Hazel's yard, but her fiancé is finally off the phone, so I introduce myself. Turns out they met because she hired him to clean the very pool that she supposedly drowned her last husband in. Circle of life, I guess. Then Roland tells me what jobs he wants me to do. He says we need you to plant the garden, scrub the bathroom, and make the hot dogs. Scrub the garden, make the bathroom, and plant the hot dogs. Got it. I didn't have hot dogs. I'm Australian. I only have sausages. While I'm doing his bitch work, I find a wedding ring lodged in the sink drain, and a note in the fridge saying, Help! My wife is starving me to death. And then I find a pacemaker buried in Hazel's garden. Oh yeah. She's a murderer. I go and tell Roland I finished the chores, and he gives me 500 bucks. Then I confront Hazel about all the sus shit I found, and she's like, Oh, my ex was just washing his hands and he dropped his ring. My other ex was just complaining about my cooking, and someone must have just dropped that pacemaker in the garden. You know, the thing that's implanted in your chest cavity. Naturally, I accuse her of murdering all her previous husbands, and she denies it outright. So, I intimidate her about it. But then she just claims that every time an ex-husband died, she had blacked out just before it happened and would wake up another level of widow, not knowing what had transpired. As if someone was controlling her. I tell her that it could happen again and kill our buddy Roland, so she sends me to tell him to leave before he's killed too. And that's it for the Dente house. So to recap, she's a four-time widow who would easily be prime suspect number one for their deaths, but she claims that she was being mind-controlled by someone else. Someone here is insane. But it seems that my simulated little Hosier has the hots for her. In fact, I'm pretty sure Hosier said something about this once. Babe. There's something fucked up about you! I just remembered that I was supposed to bury those cozies, so I go and do that, I report back to Smelly, and she tells me that the dude's ghost has gone to hell, and now I can freely roam my music room. Which is just an empty room with a CD player. I then rapid speed riz her up until I give her a floor to mop. That's three strikes, by the way. I've been in this town for like a day, and I've woohooed and wahooed everyone I could while solving everyone's problems. I'm like the Rasputin of Strangetown. And now it's time for a FIT change. While wandering around the cul-de-sac, I mosey on into this house with a glowing purple light outside and accidentally find Dr. Dominic Nulo, surrounded by bookshelves. I tell him how sus it was that he called me on a random phone immediately after the garage of my car disappeared, 
and he's just like, that kind of strangeness is inherent to the town. So naturally, I tell him I want to leave, and he reveals to me that he may know where my car is, and that if I work for him for a while, he will tell me how to find it so I can leave this deranged town. What he wants me to do is sell him any secrets I uncover about the mysteries of the universe. Five exactly, in fact. So I sell him three government secrets I've already found. One about the Roswell crash being an alien weather balloon, another one about brainwashing, and then another one about money growing on trees. So that leaves me with two more government secrets to find. We'll circle back to this guy in a minute. I then check into the next house and meet Isaac Rossum the inventor, who tells me that his wife Roberta has been malfunctioning lately, as she hasn't been cooking or cleaning. He claims he said the word malfunctioning, as apparently he spends so much time inventing that he starts to think of people as machines. This dude does not get out much. He is worried about his wife though, and is heading into town to try to find her some help, but he is worried mostly that she's so lonely sometimes. Basically, he's asking for a friend for his wife. By the way, whenever I read the term online, asking for a friend, I thought that literally meant that that person was asking for a friend, like they themselves were looking to find themselves a friend to help them. I'm also stupid. But then Jeffrey Dahmer here says that his wife is in need of a soulmate. But shouldn't that be you? You're, you're literally married to her, what? Anyway, I go to look for her and she's just straight up fucking crunking it in the kitchen. So I subtly start the conversation onto the subject of us doing some bonding. I tell her that Jeff told us to swap some spit, chew the fat, spit on fat, and she's down for it. And admits that she does literally everything that her husband tells her to do, like some sort of stepford wife. So we get right to bonding all over the floor. Intimate secret unlocked. Nothing gets a motor going faster than having a buttons pushed repeatedly. Hmm. I can't take it anymore, she says. Gag reflex, I says. Then she starts glitching out. Splines not reticulating. Inhibitor failure. She then admits that she's actually miserable. She's sick of following orders every day, but her programming forbids her to leave. So yeah, she is a Stepford wife. Literally a robot. But she just says, of course I'm a robot. Isn't everyone's wife here? She then asks me how people control their wives if they're not robots, and I inform her about women's suffrage, and she's just like, oh, what? She tells me that Dr. Nulo had made a program that would turn her into a normal wife, but she declined it. But now she believes that he was really just trying to set her free. So now what I need to do is hack Nulo's computer and steal the program behind her husband's back so it can set her free. So I head back to Nulo's house, but I can't find a computer anywhere, so I just sell him a few more secrets. He told me that after I'd sold him five, he'd give me a bonus. But when I ask about it now, he uses some gadget and teleports away. It's about to get interesting. Give me a minute. So in trying to find his Chromebook, I discover that one of his bookshelves is false and is actually a door into a secret room. I fiddle around with the bookshelf, and in the wall I come to a dank office, and am approached by Dr. Dominion, a supervillain with the full costume and everything. He even seems to be wearing a plumb bob on his chest. That is extremely notable shit for the law video, I gotta write that down. Oh dear, it looks like you've found me. Yes, I fucking have! Give me my car! I want to get out of Strange Town! Everything I do leads me back to fucking Strange Town! I'm so sick of this place! <sighs> he then calls me pathetic and then proceeds to mind control me. I, I guess with the plumb bob in his shirt. I can't say anything, but he just tells me to go away basically until he decides to summon me again. He then teleports away again and terrifyingly, I now for the first time in this game have a plumb bob above my head. But you'll notice it's more saturated and closer to a white than the typical green boy. So maybe this one's artificial? I was fairly shocked by this. Oh, and all my goals are just get out of here. It fucking is a mind control device. The doc told me that while I am being mind controlled, if I don't do what it tells me, I'll go insane but I have just enough sanity to hack his computer and get the program for Roberta like I promised. But first, quick workout sesh to get over my sim's existential dread. And to Robert we go. I stick a USB of the program in her face, and to test if she's free now, I give her some money, as her programming previously blackmailed that item ID from her inventory. And yeah, it seemed it worked. Freed by the technology of the guy who just mind controlled me. Huh. When I ask her what she'll do of herself now, she just tells me that she actually is just gonna stay with her husband anyway. Despite the fact I just backed up a hard drive with some SSD on the floor earlier. Don't worry, there's not another rap song coming. But Isaac's pretty happy about it. 
So happy, in fact, he's put his face inside my face like he's trying to eat my fucking uvula. Even sends me off with a couple bucks for my trouble. And I guess that's it for the Rossums. <laughs> now, Deputy Duncan's just told me that the entire town is littered with litter because the garbage man went missing a while ago. So apparently it's now my job to investigate that. The garbage truck is parked right outside the house of the Beakers, so go check in there. And I talked to a dude called Loki, named after the god of mischief himself. Must be trustworthy. I say hi, and he already hates me and brushes me off. So I immediately go to storm into his top secret back room to see if the garbage man is in there, but he scolds me and calls me an idiot for even going near the door. So I go watch his wife shower. Yeah, we'll just be- I'm sorry. Jesus Christ, I just walked in on that. Uh, can I use the shower, actually? You got room for two on that? I'm, like, stinky, I think. Hey. After his wife, Churchy, is done in the shower, she tells me that she suspects that Loki has acquired some very valuable patents, and that if I find them and give them to her, she will leave the house so that I may have a better chance at sneaking into that back room. So I go and talk to Loki again, and he reveals that he believes there are issues in the marriage, and that Churchy is actually keeping secrets from him. And then while perusing the house for the patents, I saw Loki doing this shit looking into the closet all sus. So, as soon as he leaves, I see what I can find. Hey, I found his secret patents! For an electric vomit recycler. I go and give the patents to Churchill, and she's like, Thanks, but I can't actually leave because the patents are in his name, so I can force him to share the big dollar it is, but I'm still not actually leaving Lamau, so here's some toonies, you loony. I then intimidate her for tricking me, and she breaks down and admits that she's been having an affair with Dr. Dominic Nulo, the guy who just mind controlled me. But she tells me that every time she's with the doc, she would be much more obedient around him, and that she doesn't know why. And I thought that I was the first victim of his mind controlling. <laughs> I thought I was special! So things are starting to make a lot more sense around here, but basically, he cucks Tom Hiddleston. So I immediately go dob her into the trickster god, and he storms off to confront her about it. This makes the perfect distraction. So while Bunsen and Beaker are occupied, I finally am able to hack my way into Loki's private lab, which is just a room with some test tubes and a bed and a toilet. Plus the missing garbage man, Jimmy Brownkirk. He gives me some cash for freeing him, and I get a call from Dr. Deminging. He commands me to go back to the Rossum's house and use something called the Imagination Lathe, or Lath, or something, to create a small statue of a god and steal Saul's hyperattractor, then give both of these to my robot shorty. Then he gives me her winter soldier code to make her do something. Newsreader, waiter, trousers. I'll have to figure out a way to work that into a sentence so that I don't suspect anything. Then as he hangs up, the mysterious fake plum bob reappears above my head again. So I go back to see Freakio's house and rip this attractor gizmo out of the what's it and then pass it on to Roberta, telling her that I stole this as a feat of strength and that she needs to hold it for me for a bit. Then I sit down in the cyberpunk Lindbach, which is the imagination lathe. I put this pasta strainer on my head and imagine a small cow statue which wills it into existence. The implications of this machine are insane. Like, couldn't Dr. Doom just use this to basically enter creative mode and do whatever he wants? Anyway, I then go and give Roberta the cow and she doesn't even question it. Dr. Strange Hatton then immediately calls me and reminds me to use the aforementioned Winter Soldier code. And I managed to choose every single dialogue prompt that wasn't the right one until I finally got it. Hold the newsreader's nose squarely, waiter, or friendly milk will countermand my trousers. What? F what Grab the weatherman's nose or I will creep into my pants. What the fuck is my guy yapping about? Roberta then rightfully screams at me for preaching my gobbledygook and then walks away from me, and the crystal disappears from above me. What the fuck did you just say to my sex bot? I was being mind controlled by the duck's hexagonal biopyramid. Ain't nothing to it, little chef made me do it, man. We all got some weird shape that controls us. Mine's a nice sozio octagon. Isaac then gets upset that his Clifford wife has run off to Dr. Daddy Dom, and he gives me a tracking device so that I might find her again. So we move downtown into Dead Tree, and he calls me to tell me to turn the device on. When this happens. I can activate the tracking device and should What the hell just ran past me? What the fuck was that? Look man, can we just make a deal? There is a lot of shit going on in this game, so can we just cross that bridge when we get to it? It's not a bridge I want to cross, it's kind of like... You know that bridge that was in that one Colin Eastwood movie, and... It's like they were actually going to blow it up, but they were going to let the Spanish army do it because it was their bridge. And then they accidentally blew it up while they weren't even shooting yet. So then the Spanish army had to rebuild the entire fucking bridge. And then they blew it up again. 
Anyway, as I'm about to look for Roberta, I get stopped by Roland, who we rescued from Hazel ages ago, now wearing a white gown. He asks me if I ever feel lost, if I wonder if I'm part of a vast herd, purposeless. Do I look to squeeze the last drop out of the udders of life? This conversation is going to make me lactose intolerant. He seems to have forgotten about everything that happened before and has since been abducted into a cult called the Kind Society. He then makes me pay $50 for a pamphlet about his beliefs. Always stay with the herd. A stray cow falls into the figure. Always keep your eyes on the cow in front of you. Attention yields obedience. Always look into the future. The path behind you is a stream of shit. Always be wary. The enemy tips the cow who sleeps. So out of curiosity, I enter the Kind Society dairy building, and a dude named Rick Wong tells me that to enter, I need an invitation from the leader Sinjin, who is behind the door, I need an invitation to get through, from the guys behind the door, the door I need to get through, in order to get the invitation to go through the door. So instead, Rick just tests me on the four core tenets of their cult, all that shit that was on the pamphlet. I perfectly recite the four cow commandments, and I'm granted access inside, and it's just a barn with a stage and two cows for some reason. I see this woman who stole my name. She's a pirate, you even stole my RR. And she calls me a maggot and tells me to go away. I thought cults were supposed to be overly nice to bring you in. Like, I prefer the fucking Mormons over this. Now I'm only going to briefly consider joining this cow-themed cult. Also, by the way, while poking around the barn, I accidentally found Roberta's leg. I completely forgot that I was supposed to be finding her. But instead of doing that, I go and introduce myself to Sinjin while he's taking a bath. Nobody in this entire town has any issue with me just coming and watching them bathe. It's pretty cool. In fact, now I may softly consider joining this cow-themed cult. But he tells me I can't join the secret society without passing his inspection, which I would already fail because I don't have a copy of a book called the Bovinomicon. I also need to learn the daily ritual and gain sponsorship by one of the current members. So immediately I go and get myself a Bovinomicon from the gift shop out the front. It reads, The Great Cow Beezel Beef slumbers beneath the surface of the earth. Wasn't that the name of the cow god in Sims 2 for the DS? So this this cow cult is a recurring group then. And not only that, but the cow god sleeps beneath the earth, not like a god in the skies or anything. She's just under us. That's kinda creepy. When she rises again, she will awaken the Elder Herd, and the Elder Herd will trample all those who strengthen the teachings of the kind. Once the earth is cleansed, there will be a new era of peace and delicious grass. TLDR, cow god underground, when above ground, more cow kill all. World end except for cow people. Cow people get mow lawn and peace. Since you not read the book of the moment, can I call you daddy? Never mind, he's levitating from the fucking toilet. Of course he is. Fuck this shit, I hate this fucking place. He sends me away from his fecal ceremony to talk to the chick who stole my name. Then she gets pissed at me because she's busy studying to become Lavache, which is the mother of the kine, so that she may be the consort to someone called the El Toro, Spanish for the bull. Ay caramba. And she's so obsessed with this mystery minotaur that she loses control, wink wink, whenever she's with him because to her, she's a father, a teacher, and a husband all at once. Sister is straight fucked up in the head. I know we got the country theme going on here, but she's got some kinks. But you know, I'm an up-and-coming kind member or whatever the fuck, so I'm all about forgiveness in that junk. So once again, I invite her to join me on the floor. <coughs> I give her a bit of the old cotton eye Joe mama, and I learn that her secret is she wants to usurp the dude worshipping his own shit back there. I don't want anything to do with that kind of drama, so she just teaches me the ritual, and away we go. All you gotta do is hit the button correlating to the direction of the dance move the leader does on the stage. Kowtar Hero. There's four moves. The Crown of Horns? The Sacred Cud. Lowing at the moon. And fertilizing the field. Just literally shit on the floor. I managed to pass, and I get some cash. By the way, it seems that while the zombie minigame makes you want to throw up, this minigame makes you need to drop some bears. I kick Sinjin out of the bath so I can use it real quick, and I'm ready for his inspection. And now, I'm ready to move up the cult ranks to yearling. And that's it for the cult for now. Right after that, I'm stopped by the garbage man's cousin, who tells me that a family built the townhouse and used to own all the strange town land. But a supposed squatter named Ophelia is currently stealing residence in the townhouse. And Peter here assigns me to befriend Ophelia and find this will that she's using to claim that she's inherited the building. So I go into the meeting house, which is just a church, and Ophelia has moved into it. She mistakes me for a zombie, Fairly enough though, I have been having a lot of unprotected woohoo constantly, so I probably do have some kind of SIM-TI or SIM-TD. 
Especially after trying out everyone's bed and bathrooms like Goldilocks. I'm surprised my fucking bones aren't melting. Ophelia claims that this place is not only cursed, but that her mother left the building to her. Before I can press her any further though, I need to rush home to sleep. But when I do that, Emily the maid stops me and tells me about the ghost that still remains in my house. So hold on, just put Ophelia on hold for a second. The second ghost was some dude who went out with the waitress in the bar downtown. And there were two pods and a bean, but his broke ass signed himself up to be one of Loki's test subjects on the nervous system. Um, this guy is a recurring character called Nervous Subject. He's in the other Sims games. And his dad is Death, I don't know. But Loki just kept Nervous so miserable that one of Loki's machines just straight up killed him on the spot. Which can apparently happen, as Emily says, most of the high-tech machines will only work if you're in a good mood. Otherwise, you'll probably die a horrid death. So, machines will kill you if you're in a bad mood. What a time to be alive. When Nervous Guy disappeared, his girlfriend Annie thought that he'd run off with some hoe, so now I have to find his grave and return Annie a charm that she had gifted him, so that she knows that he still loved her when he died. And conveniently enough, his grave is right behind the townhouse Ophelia's living in, so I rush straight to the cemetery. It has a few zombies walking around in a pattern that I think you're supposed to carefully avoid, but I just dealt with them. I'm one of them at this point, so who cares? Oh yeah, I found one of Roberta's arms. Remember that plot going on? We'll get back to it someday. Anyway, I take it upon myself to check out all the headstones to try to find the one belonging to Nervous, and I get some random bits of lore. Mambo might have killed this guy. This guy died of hot coffee. Must have really liked that San Andreas mod. Oh, deceit and illusion! Tristan, where are you? Wait, Tristan? As in Tristan Legend, who we last met in Sims 2 for the DS? My guy must have caught one too many meteors. But hey, if that's the same Tristan, then I guess this game would be set after Sims 2 DS in the timeline? Um, I believe that's more shit for the theory video. I then find a Christmas cracker joke. Anyway, I've walked through the desert for a grave of no name, and finally found the good luck charm that belongs to Nervous. So we head to the saloon here in Dead Tree, and immediately hit on the waitress for a sensual massage. Naturally, she gets pissed and tells me she's not my... Harem slave, which is a term I did not expect to see in this game. Then to apologize, I'm essentially like, Yo, babe, I'm sorry about asking for the seamless Grand Slam. Here, check this. It's your dead boyfriend's four-leaf clover. And she's like, oh, what? And that's it. So now the bedroom ghost is gone, which barely matters because you can put like 10 items in your entire house and these massive fuck-off rooms are essentially pointless. Anyway, I go back to the hermit and I gain her trust. And she tells me that out of anger of people calling her a hermit, she knocked over a bookcase where her mother's will was kept. Which she says is completely unlike her. Like some outside force was making her do it. God damn, Dr. Dominatrix is really just using everyone to start shit, isn't he? So I go across the road to the library where I might find the knocked up pussy, and I find Roberta's other arm, currently being used as an antenna. I hack the computer to disengage it and yoink it. Then I meet Lincoln Broadsheet a reporter, and a private investigator. You may have noticed that he's floating, and apparently that's because Isaac made him this hovering gizmo, because he's too heavy for his legs to hold. His kind of a brian ass cranium is just too broad. The chat let me know, by the way, that this guy is usually in a wheelchair in the other games, but I guess they were too lazy to make a wheelchair this time. As it turns out, this guy is another secret vendor, and this one is interested in gossip. His white whale story, however, is that of the secrets of a woman called Virginia Fang, who works at the saloon. Mostly because she's introverted and went to the graveyard once, so another job for me is to investigate her. We'll have to circle back to that though, as I've just checked the bookshelf awful kicked over, and it does have the will, and it turns out her claim to the townhouse is valid. She inherited it, fair and rhomboid. I leave to report back to Peter Griffin, and encounter a motherfucking werepug- OH SHIT! This game is sucking my life force. I said this on a stream too, but this game really was just gonna suck the life out of me until it looked like the fucking fetus Voldemort. Like a human raisin. Anyway, I brush off getting five nights at Freddy's and tell Peter Bread that the will is real. She's pissed because there's a family heirloom in a cemetery and she suggests stealing the whole building in front of it. However, I, remaining unfortunately sane, just decide to go into the cemetery and get the thing she wants. So I find the grave that shares her last name, dig it up, take the heirloom, take it back to Peter, and that's it. Oh yeah, when I was in the graveyard earlier, I did find something out about Lincoln's little crush he wants me to snoop on. Virginia Fang. 
There's a 100-year-old grave here that shares her last name. And actually, her first name. Maybe she's up to some Bella Goff-style time travel. I go back to Lincoln and tell him about it, and he's like, Go read a book, nerd. We didn't know if it's the same person. So I find the book, and there's a picture of the Virginia of 100 years ago. Can you spot the difference? There isn't any. Shut up. Lincoln points out that the book says that the old Virginia went missing, and could have survived all these years somehow. He tells me to harass other people about her, and so I intimidate the bin man Jimmy. And he admits that he's been selling packets of plasma to her. I wonder where this is going. Crazy iron deficiency, it's gotta be. So I go and tell Lincoln about this shady shit, and he tells me to go and confide in Massachusetts to figure out what's going on here. So I go and find Virginia, and speed her on my way to a kiss, because my Riz is fucking abominable at this point. I then somehow manage to accidentally intimidate her, and then learn that apparently there is some bad blood going way back between Virginia and the Kind Society. But how way back are we talking here, I wonder? I apologize to her for $200 it is and get straight back to chatting her up. And then Emily calls me to let me know that the IRS is at my door. Ignore her and push on. I flirt my way into what I think is going to be a kiss and instead she bites me in the neck. And as it turns out, duh, Virginia is a vampire and has been undead since the 19th century. She says that in 100 years she's never found a cure. And I actually have to suck people's blood to survive now. So I guess I am also now a vampire. This shit ain't nothing to me, man. I'm smoking 30 saute chicken Lincoln logs a day until I die pneumonia. I'm moving like William Henry Harrison. My lungs look like three rainbow paddle pops. Shit ain't nothing to me, man. My simoleon plum bobs come from the most horrific situations possible. I resurrected a mammoth just so I could smoke a blunt with a real life snuffleupagus. Shit cost me to stay to Pleasant Town. I run this block like it's Sim City, kid. I set downtown ablaze just so I could smoke its essence. Shit ain't nothing to me, man. I'm smoking big doinks and simlish, motherfucker. I'll fucking kill you. A soul soul gurn or feeble Sure bow meek woof em lalo until baba. So hungwa, booba snot vans unch motherfucker. Virginia apologizes profusely for turning me and leaves me to find a cure for the both of us. Instead, however, I find a number of Roberta's legs under a table and her torso hidden in this chest behind Peter's bread. And now we've found all of Roberta's bits, so we're gonna leave the vampire subplot for a second and return this dismantled robot wife to Charles Manson. Is a sentence no one has ever said before. I return Roberta's legs, arms, and torso to Isaac, and he's like, no head? So Dr. Dominguing must have kept a head for some reason, which is a bit sus, but he's gone AWOL, so that's it for now. So back to finding a cure for my vampirism, I return to Mamba Loa, as I assume she knows something about this type of nonsense. And she does, mostly unbothered by my Jared Leto Morbius condition, and tells me that I need to cook up a cure which is made from garlic and a whole fucking liter of blood. Or rather, plasma. So I buy some plasma off of Peter, I don't know if she's Virginia's dealer or whatever, but we move onwards and make the vampirism cure. I cure myself, and then I give another cure to Virginia. And since she hasn't eaten in like over a century, she pushes me out of the way to go get a Zinger crunch wrap, and that's it for the vampire bit. But keeping on the twilight beat, I thought I might as well type the loose end of that werepug earlier. <sighs> Remember that? This game is a lot. Anyway, in the glance that we had of the werepug, we could see that the thing had pigtails and jorts on. And so does the waitress at the VIP lounge. I intimidate her and am told that she looked like she was about to snap. And you know, getting upset for being berated in customer service is suspicious. So I decide to taser. <laughs> And my hunch was correct, because when I do so, she turns into the night beast in front of me and everyone else present, which of course, pisses her off. I mean, look at her face right now. That is just pure, raw annoyance. The stream chat said that this looked like a new Fortnite skin, and I couldn't agree more, but I'd argue this is even better. Anyway, Dog Girl is furious that I've ruined her life by outing her in front of everyone, and explains that she turns into this thing every time she gets mad, which is every day since she's a waitress. So naturally I offer to pay for anger management classes, but I can't afford it, so I gotta go make some money first. The best way to make money in this game, by the way, is to up your creativity skill and make paintings in the Dente's backyard and sell them. And you can do this fairly quick between trips to their bed and then back again. And soon enough, I had well over 3,000 Somalians. I go back to the saloon and pull Annie off the toilet and give her 700 bucks, and she thanks me and goes on a merry way. Hang in there, we're getting close now. Before I can leave the ladies' bathroom, Sinjin calls me to head back to the cult barn, as he has something to discuss with me. He has received word from his enigmatic El Toro that we are ready to usher in the Great Stampede, 
which he explains is the end of the world where his god Beezlebeep will summon the Elder Herd to trample the earth clean of defilement. It's the cow equivalent of the rapture, get it? Keep up, soy drinker. How about you tolerate some lactose, you bean skeleton? Anyway, he tells me that Deltora Quest specifically requested that I, of all people, go on some mission for preparation, as he, quote, seems to know me quite well. So I gotta make him a nicer cow idol and some shit called cow puri and place it in the censer, which, by the way, is what those incense pod things are called. I don't know that, so the more you know. So I skip off back to the creative mode machine and make a brand new golden cow idol. Why don't I just use this thing to give myself a new car to get out of this headache? I, I guess we're just too far into it now to turn back. So I take the new idol back to the barn and pick up some cow dung with my bare hands. When I go back to the bin to get rid of it, I then accidentally pick up some uranium ore. Oh god, I'm getting Sims 2 DS flashbacks. Anyway, I turn back to Sips Co to ask him what the fuck is going on, and then without meaning to, I set him on fire with my mind. I forgot to mention that I'd gone and bought a bunch of these weird abilities you can just have, including the set a bitch on fire button. But none too bothered by my accidental immolation, I just hand him the new cow idol and he's like, oh sweet, thanks, and then sends me to make that cow pori stuff I mentioned before. Which is a grand recipe. Milk and the shit I just picked up. Smelly poo. Awesome, thanks. Then they want me to put it in the incense burner as well. Awesome, epic, just an all around positive experience. I am going to headbutt a nail. I am going to put a nail in my frontal cortex. A nail will be thrust upon my amygdala and I'm going to die. I'm so sick of this. Anyway, we all come together with the El Toro guy up in the middle there and we hit the gritty. And then the barn begins to shake. So hard in fact that it crashed my game. I think the game's frozen. Oh, when was the last time I saved? <laughs> Why? Beazle pussy, shut the f- <laughs> I can't. And I had to do the dance again. So the barn shakes, and the floor opens up, filling the room with steam. And out of the earth rises the actual, real god, Beazle Beef himself. Sinjin hides himself from this insanity, and I look over to El Toro to see what he thinks of this shit, and he does a little spin and reveals himself to be Dr. Dominion in disguise. Then he prods Beazlebeef with this thing, and then teleports away with her. What is he doing that requires a cow god and Roberta's head? I go talk to Sinjin, and he's pissed. I try to explain who Dr. Dominion is, but he doesn't care. He's just furious that everything he believed in is fake. Except for, you know, cow god. So, not everything is lost, you'd think. That's like being disappointed if you found out the rapture or the Garden of Eden or the Ark isn't real, but God is. Like, is he not like the main bit? <sighs> Whatever. I tell him that the doctor uses mind control, and he reveals that he had a big green diamond above his head for a while too. So he was also being mind controlled at one point. Anyway, Sinjin tells me that I should go find his cousin Laszlo who works at Division 47, where they study UFOs and shit apparently. And maybe he would know something about the cow and the mind control. I ask him if he'll tag along, but he chooses to remain and continue to lead his cult since even though they think it's false now, even though he just witnessed God, they still live happily by its core tenets. Which is true because the cow god exists. This feels like the longest episode of Supernatural or something, but we are getting there, so just hold on a little bit longer. In fact, let's take a break before we move on. I'll buy a hot tub, place it in the square center of my living room, have sex with a maid in it, do a bit of Cirque du Soleil, and we're back out into the field and onwards to Area 51, I mean, Division 47. I am greeted by Laszlo Curious, one of the researchers and Sinjin's cousin he mentioned. He tells me that he's got me clearance to go and start working in the barracks, as I can't get into the labs just yet. There's a UFO crashed into the gate over here, by the way. Just thought I'd mention that. Anyway, I head into the subterranean barracks and see this green dude, and watch him and his lady take a shower. Then I try to introduce myself. Turns out this is Johnny Smith, the same Johnny Smith who I'd previously met in Sims 2 for the DS, and whom I'm sure you'll remember I was very kind and welcoming and hospitable towards. Who are you? I'm sick of this fucking town! Where the fuck did you get a bunyip? Why are you green? Why in the fuck are you green? I remind him that he is in fact green, and he gets tilted and calls me a jerk, and then apologizes for his bad mood. He says that it sucks living here, and that he's not allowed to leave since his dad thinks he'll get bullied for having an alien heritage. He then tells me that all of this comes from a guy called General Grunt, who used to be his neighbor, and is now a psycho in Johnny's own words. General Grunt convinced Johnny Sr. to move the family into this military compound for their own safety. 
He wants out. And to get out, he needs a fake ID and for me to loop the security feed so Tank Grunt doesn't see him leaving, which I'll have to fix Tank's computer in order to do. I find Tank's computer, and luckily enough, my mechanical skill is high enough to just fix the Mac and make Johnny's new fake ID. For some reason, I tell Tank I fixed his computer, I guess I just wanted the credit for it, and he tells me that he has a job for me. He tells me that he's starting to become suspicious of Johnny Smith, and tells me that that isn't even his real name, and that before he got married, it was Pollination Technician 9. He then demands that if I find anything sus out about him, that I tell him immediately. And I'm like, oh yeah, for sure, buddy. Totally didn't just hack your computer because that guy told me to. Don't worry about it, you can trust me. Anyway, I then go and introduce myself to his brother, General Buzz Grunt. He's immediately enraged that Laszlo recommended me for a job. Your existence offends me and your odor offends me more. If you want a civilian, I have you dragged out and whipped. All I did, by the way, is walk in here. So I check the perks menu to see if there's anything I can buy to make him trust me immediately. And I discover that I can purchase a mind reader ability that allows me to instantly gain knowledge of anyone's secrets. So immediately I go and suck everyone's darkest secrets out of their heads so I can sell them and get rich. Tank, when he was a kid, wanted to do ballet, but his daddy said no. He also blames Rip for stealing his first love, which was an action figure. I get a massive headache from using my powers and take some Panadol. Rode Tank's mind again to discover he was punished by Buzz for being too creative with his face pa face pa face pain. Rip walks into lampposts and is bald. I get another massive headache, so I go to get myself some more Hedefin, but actually it's more than that. Because I fall onto the ground and really actually fucking die on the spot. I answer my phone as a ghost and speak to the Grim Reaper. I guess it wasn't important enough to meet him face to face. Or he works at the telephone company. Actually, I'd believe Telstra would employ Death into the workforce. Fucking Telstra. Death then tells me about the resurrection packages. The most expensive one being gold, which is only usually offered to members of our elite Frequent Dyers program. Frequent Dyers program. I want to know who the hell is in that program. They need to address this in Congress and demand that Death leaks the black box for the fucking Frequent Dyers package, because I want to know. I want that package. I'd probably be using that a lot since I'm playing this freaking game. And so yeah, I buy that package and I'm straight back to life and immediately abusing my powers again. Rips has a fear of skibbity toilet, by the way. Buzz shaves his chest every morning, and he got stripes for opening letters. Johnny thinks green skin is equivalent to red skin in terms of bully ability. Buzz sleeps with a teddy bear named the Brigadier, and Johnny used to look like a squid. I have the potential to be the ultimate blackmailer at this point. If I just kept selling secrets, I could just keep buying my way out of death. I could probably dig up dirt on death. I'm not fucked up. Jenny likes the smell of napalm. She's the one that's fucked up. You got a problem with me personally? 47, 35, 57.584. 332, 5.233. Anyway, I go and loop the security feed at the tank's computer and then give Johnny his new ID and he leaves immediately for Dead Tree. Now that he's gone, I decide to ask Johnny's mum a few questions about the guy I just set loose onto the world. But she doesn't trust me enough yet, so I befriend her as fast as I can while Tank Grunt takes a piss like 500 times. Look at him go! I feel like he's just doing it to eavesdrop, but he's gonna run out of liquid eventually, surely. Is that true they found Colin out in the desert? No, what? Yeah, the FBI took him out there, and they took him in for questioning, and he said that he'd been abducted by aliens. <laughs> oh shit. But here's the real kicker. He said that when he was inside their spaceship or whatever, they put him in a room with a bed, and slow jazz and roses, and candles and shit. And then this one huge alien came in, and started rubbing his feet. But he was embarrassed, so Colin rubbed the alien leg. But it wasn't really his leg, it was his willy. And basically, Colin's pregnant. Oh, nice. Well, yeah, and they said that for a joke, they went and zapped every glass of chocolate milk and changed its atomic makeup to convert the milk into sperm. Uh-huh. But also, it turns out that the Statue of Liberty is an ancient being built by an ancient race of dwarves to be turned into a new god. But to keep it from being activated, they have to keep feeding it homeless people. Oh, well, they have it my uncle, I think. Yeah, and also, by the way, <laughs> it's John Ford. What? No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, I end up finding out that Jenny's husband has been rummaging around that old UFO like every night around midnight. But it's not his ship as they were already living here when it crashed. So she wants me to figure out what's going on by catching him at midnight. But I have a bit of time to kill before then, so I go to try to befriend Buzz Grunt for that job. And while I do succeed at becoming his friend, he needs to keep up appearances as a cold bitch basically. So he calls me a fat, flatulent fork pusher and sends me to clean the toilets. Or rather, lick every toilet clean, and say I like it. But really, only just clean them. Also pick up the trash in the lab. This dude has got a fistful of fetishes, and another fistful of issues, and I want nothing to do with either of them. 
So I go and clean the toilets and discover that Tank Grunt might actually have some kind of health issues I can't define. Symptoms being an endless loop of pissing and showering. Maybe he's trying to get a world record water bill. Now all I gotta do is tidy up the laboratories. So I go there and Laszlo tells me about a device called the Yonder Extraterrestrial Intelligence, or Yeti, which they are using to contact some other aliens in space. However, he also tells me that while the Yeti does work, the alien that is communicating to them through it is constantly ringing them up to chat, and that he'll actually pay me to shut him up for a bit. So what kind of advanced alien language or symbols or runes am I going to have to learn to talk to this guy? For all I know, he exists in a higher dimension to me. I'm out to transcend my mind to glimpse into time itself to be able to communicate. It's Simon Says. It's the Simon Says minigame, that's it. Circle, circle, X, circle, that's the whole thing. Anyway, while I was cleaning up the laboratory, I ended up discovering a long, dark hallway in the back of the base which leads to a vault door, guarded by this Mr. X-Files looking guy. I read his mind, and all I can get out of him is that he likes him thick, cleaned, and untrimmed. Like socks. So I try to intimidate him, but he's a bit more strong-willed than the average person. And frankly, I don't like the cut of his jib. So I SHOW HIM THE FLAME OF THE ANCIENTS! And I give him a little noogie. But he yawns in my face while he burns. Not enough. I try again, and this time I tase him as well. Still no cigar. I get institutionalized real quick. Probably because I just saw a guy who was a bit pale and set him on fire and tased him. But I immediately run back and keep repeating the process until eventually he finally breaks and reveals the password to the door behind him. I don't even have any business with the door, but now I have a password, so stick it into the computer and take the elevator even deeper underground to a bunker where they're keeping military supplies and vehicles. And I even find an alien family photo album for some reason, so I'll just take it. I find a deserted room with nothing in it, except for a curtain and an operation table, plus a bunch of those body drawer things. I then stumble onwards down the hallway and discover a locked door that I can't open yet. But then also a room covered in starry wallpaper and spotlights holding a crib in the center. Inside the crib is a quite green baby. So naturally, I pick it up and put it in my pocket as a snack for later or something. Its item description says its name is Tycho and it is 400 pounds. What the fuck? I have no idea what I'm meant to do with any of this, but now I have a baby in my back pocket, so there's that. When I return upstairs, I see this blonde guy with an exclamation point above his head, so I speak to him. And immediately, he knows that I'm speaking to him just because I physically saw the symbol there. Turns out, he created this form of telepathy which allows me to know when someone really wants to speak with me. But his is bugged out. It's pretty strange that they would take this time to give an in-universe explanation to another thing you just assume is a simple game feature for the player. I wonder if this means any more than we think it does. By the time I leave the lab, it's now 4 in the morning, and I happen to catch Johnny's alien father poking about the spaceship that crashed into the dirt. He refuses to tell me what he's doing until I build up some trust between us, and then he reveals that Jenny was not his first wife, and that he had a family before her and Johnny. He tells me that one of his alien friends came to deliver his old family photos to him, but the military shot him down, hence the crashed UFO right here. So this guy comes out here every single night to look for this photo album, but I just found it in the basement, so I give it to him, and he's pissed off because that means General Grunt knew he was looking for the album, but withheld it from him beyond his knowledge anyway. He doesn't say anything though about the alien infant which is currently eating lint in my back pocket, so I just leave him alone and go clean up the labs like I was supposed to do. So I go and do that, but there's still no sign of anyone missing a 400 pound baby. I report back to General Buzz Grunt, and he kind of says thank you, and gives me 800 bucks. But then I go back to the lab, and this dude called Pascal Curious, who knows about my involvement with the Mad Cow people, tells me he's got a big problem. His son Tycho, the very motherfucker in my back pocket, is missing, he says. He says that he believes the men in black stole the baby from him, because he gave birth to it after being abducted. This is a thing that apparently happens in The Sims all the time, by the way, so don't worry about it. Anyway, he wants me to find out exactly who took the baby from him. I try to tell him I'm in fact holding said baby as I speak, but it's not even an option. The game won't let me tell him I literally have his baby right now. So, as it turns out, I broke the game by breaking the sequence of events by accident. What I was supposed to do was learn about the missing baby, interrogate everyone in the labs, then find out it's underground guarded by Slenderman, and then rescue the baby Tycho. But instead of that, I just arrived here, saw the guy in black, and was just like, yeah, I bet I could make him cry, and then proceeded to cast destruction spells at him until he let me pass, and I just happened to find the original gangster and abducted him myself. So now, instead of just, you know, giving the guy his son back, 
I have to go around and talk to every single person and interrogate them for their alibis. So blah blah blah, Pascal tells me it's this guy called Vidkin. I go on Flicky's nose and he admits that he was trying to reanimate guinea pig tissue with microwave radiation. Naturally. And ran out of funding. Then the man in black asked him to do some random favors until one day, Slenderman got the overwhelming urge to steal the baby and couldn't control it. So I guess Dr. Dominion also might control this freak to break another family apart for some reason. He might just be a dick and that's it, I don't know yet. So now the game will finally allow me to give Pascal his baby back and he's like, thank God. Then very soon after, Isaac calls me up again. He tells me that since Dr. Dumb Dumb Idiot isn't home, he's been rummaging through his shit and found a note with orangutan written on it, but with fours instead of A's. So what's it for? The locked door in the basement from earlier. Well, actually no, because that's a fake door that you can just walk through, I guess, because they got too lazy to animate it. But what's behind that? Another secret office with a green force field in it and a computer on the desk. That is what the password is for. I enter orangutan and gain access to the somewhat sentient laptop. It tells me that inside the green force field that it controls is the doc's teleportation gadget, which is preloaded with all of his most frequented locations. Therefore, if I can steal it, I might be able to find him and beat him up once and for all. I tell Alexa to give me the TP gadget, and it tells me that I have to answer five questions correctly to verify that I am the doctor himself. And all of these questions are about previous events of the game so far. So... How did Sinjin react when he saw you abduct the easel beep? He hid like a little bitch. What was that UFO coming here for? To deliver Boxing Day photos. Who have you been bumping bellies with? Churchill. Where does my mother keep her donuts? In the pin. Where did Pascal find the jelly baby? In his fat fucking pussy. Let me in. I need to kill Dr. Dominion. Please, for the love of God. Seems legit. Thankfully, I get enough questions correct and the computer disengages the force field. I grab the teleporter and it shows me a map of everywhere we've been so far, as well as one place we haven't been called the Monument. So I teleport there and finally, we're at the final part of the game. Dr. Dominic is here and he approaches me, pretending to be cowering in fear at my arrival before laughing. You know that I'm joking, right? Your arrival is merely a part of my elaborate scheme. He then finally reveals why he's doing all of this. He says that long ago he was always haunted by the idea that he was not in control of his actions. He'd eat and sleep and watch TV whenever he wanted, until out of nowhere an external force would seize him and force him to do things he didn't want to do. The entity made him study constantly and go to work every day to make more money to improve his house. This being what the average player in real life would have their sim do in the game. Other than of course make all the Avengers live in one house and have Tony and Cat be gay lovers. Or, you know. Destiel, but we, we don't talk about that one anymore. Don't worry about it. I love you. Being controlled by an outside force, Dominic would become depressed, but would never be freed by the endless study, work, buy, treadmill, as he puts it. As he continued to study against his will, he became smart enough to become aware of the green diamond above his head. That was what was controlling him. So somehow he invented his helmet, which would allow him to take use of the diamond and take control of other people himself. I ask him why he needs me of all people, and he explains that I'm different. Everyone else here follows the exact same routines every day of their lives, while I seem to be the only other one here acting of my own volition. He points out that everyone else is helpless to solve their own problems until I arrive, and then they tell me everything as if I'm some kind of hero. So I ask him if he means to say that my sim is the only one with free will, and he rejects the very idea outright, claiming that my guy is the protagonist and therefore is being controlled directly by an outside force. This guy in the sim world has figured out exactly what the sims are, or rather, what the sims is. I ask then what even can be done. And he says that there is only something that he can do for me. Using Beezel Beef's milk for fuel, kind of weird that he has a literal god captive and it's just using it as a battery, but anyway. And using Roberta's brain as a control system, he plans to reach through my sim's mind and take control of me in real life. It calls me, Star, personally, a horrible creature that thinks it's playing a harmless game and has no compassion for the lives I destroy. He says that he will make me respect his superiority. My electrons tell my brain to tell my body to tell my hands to tell my guy to tell this dude he's crazy. And he tells me to fuck off, because at least he will be acting on his own free will. I'm about to end this man's whole career. I ask him how he can be so sure that he does have free will. 
and he says that everything he's done to oppose me in the town would run against real me's best interests. And again, moving my 4D rook into position, I say, well, if my controller thinks it's playing a game, then it needs an opposition, right? Not everyone has diamonds above their heads. Some of them just follow scripted routines like you said. So what if you, motherfucker, have just been scripted to be the antagonist, and you're only here to provide me with a challenge? He freaks out a bit and is like, no, 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 no. I command my destiny, me and me alone. I tell him he was just scripted to say that too. He freaks out more, claims that I'm trying to cloud his mind. I tell them the truth. Your mind doesn't exist. It's just a string of commands in a file somewhere. Your hair, whack. Your helmet. Whack! Your shoes! Whack! The way you don't even have free will! Whack! Me? I'm self as fuck! Dr. Dominion is really freaking out now, and he tells me he's had enough. He's gonna stop me right now. It's because of this self-aware freak that I've gone through hell. I've dealt with the undead. I've gone insane multiple times. I've been treated as everyone's trauma dump and fuck buddy. I've even died once. This video is like an hour long, but worst of all, it's his fault that I've had to return to my childhood nightmares from Sims 2 for the DS. Worst of all, he made me come back to Strangetown. I have two minutes to stop him. I look around for what I can do and I find my fucking car in the mechanic! I go up to good old Oscar and he's got Dr. Dominion's crystal above his head. He was forced to build the machine. He said that he was the best mechanic in the world. He tells me that the main parts are in fact the cow god and Roberta's head, so they must be the weak spots. I spam circle to rip this gizmo off the easel beef's stomach and free her. Meanwhile, the doc just laughs maniacally the whole time. Next I find Roberta's head wired up to the machine. I smash that like button in square to turn her off. Nulo is enraged and he zips his mind control crystal above my head and then begins trying to intimidate me. But I persevere. I resist and argue back. I even manage to use my powers to tase him and set him on fire. He tries to take control of the crystal, but I use some insane mental power and deflect the crystal right back at him. He screams in anguish before a vortex appears behind him and explodes, sending me through the air and crashing onto the floor. A familiar sight. I find Roberta's head between my knees and I pick her up. And then I stand to find that Nulo is nowhere to be seen. I reach for the helmet, still holding the crystal above it, and the game fades to black. And now for some reason I'm back at Isaac's house. I give him his wife's head back and tell him I defeated Dr. Nulo. I also tell him what Nulo said about the reality of this world, but Isaac, being an NPC, just brushes it off. And that's it! All of this happened because one sim worked out that they're in a simulation. Or rather, was written to think that, whatever. But you might have thought, why were we teleported back to Isaac of all people? Well, as it turns out, Isaac is most likely meant to be a depiction of Will Wright, the creator of The Sims, which is kind of clever. I feel bad for calling him a serial killer now. I'm Will Wright, bitch! The character looks a bit like him, and also one of his secrets is that he used to be a city planner, a la Sim City. And another of his secrets is that he developed a single-celled organism which is rapidly evolving. This being a reference to the fact that Will Wright also made the game Spore. So when I told him about what Dr. Nulo said about the reality of this world, he probably brushed it off, because he already knows. And that's it. Naturally, to reward myself, I go back home, call my maid and two other women, and have a four-way in the hot tub. But there's a couple other things that we need to talk about. Namely, Beezlebeef, who we previously heard about back in DS Strangetown, is a real physical being. So that's at least one god that exists in the Sims universe. Still no reference to any of the llama stuff we found in Castaway, though. It didn't even seem like the aliens in this game were interested in the whole mind control thing at all. Although I still don't get why Nulo orchestrated for that baby to be stolen. Maybe he thought the baby would usurp him? I don't know. And yeah, there was also vampires and werewolves and ghosts and zombies and all that jazz. 
Plus, Bella Goth was here at the beginning. That alone is huge. It's even canon now that we steamboat willied on the gas station floor a few times. This all being quite notable if we ever get around to making that lore video someday. But yeah, that was quite an experience. So, here's the recap. We freed two ghosts, ruined at least a few families, became a vampire, taste a welfare and a supervillain, and a CIA agent, smacked Zami, stole an alien baby, liberated another alien, argued squatters, rice, joined a cult, witnessed God, died, came back, did a robot, and a ghost made and a fuck ton of other people, and then denied a man true sentience. He was he was trying to achieve actual self-awareness. And that is the Shakespearean Twilight Zone-esque plot to a spin-off for Sims 2 on the fucking PlayStation Portable. I don't even know anybody that had a PlayStation Portable. I don't think I've even ever seen one in real life. And they've used this fucking plot, which I adore, for, for fucking Sims 2 for the PSP. Why the fuck is this plot hidden here? And why is none of this addressed ever again, as far as I know? If I had a PlayStation Portable as a kid and I played this, I think I would have, like... I think my brain would have grown a little bit differently, you know? It's like one guy had an idea for a villain and was just like, we'll just go around this. Where we put it? I don't know. On a console that nobody's ever fucking had. Let's just stick it on there. No one will know. But, I mean, clearly people had it because this was the most requested game that I had. Like, I feel like it's all going to be downhill from here, but I guess we'll just have to see. But this game was a mess in the best way possible. It's like a Pollock painting. Like, you look at it, you don't get it. You get into it, you still don't get it, but you come out and you're like, well, I'm glad I experienced it. From arriving at Strange Town and having to deal with everyone's plots with the undead and the vampires and the werewolves and the aliens and just everyone's weird, suspicious alibis and all sorts of shit going on, and having to solve all of these problems on your own, all on your crusade, to be like, no, you don't deserve to be self-aware. But it's fascinating, and I'm glad that you guys requested me to play this, and that I actually did, because it's definitely worth playing. And we'll probably never have a game like this ever again when you think about it, at least not in the Sims franchise, because, like, with the spin-offs, it was like, they were trying something every time, like, oh, for the DS, what will we do? Uh, hotel management. What will we do for this other one? Oh, you know, let's make a survival game. Let's, what will we do for the fucking PlayStation Portable? Let's make the most Shakespearean and advanced plot with a whole bunch of shit going on, full of minigames and all sorts of crap. And now that The Sims Today is just, you know, one big game full of bugs and a million DLCs, we'll probably never get spin-offs like this again, but God, I hope that we do someday, because this stuff is the best of the franchise, and I'm glad that we played it. So, thank you all for watching, and requesting, and waiting, but thank you all for being here. This has been Sims 2 for the PSP. Like and subscribe, please, this video was so much work. Oh yeah, by the way, don't think that I forgot, or that I won't uphold the promise. Because the Sims 2 Castaway video did hit 10,000 likes, and the next big project video, maybe not the next video, because there's a couple streams, and if you haven't watched the streams, I've been around for them, I stream every Monday at 8 o'clock. There's a couple streams I might edit down into videos, but the next full-on big project will be me and my mates going out into the bush to build a cubby house. I don't know how we're going to do it, I don't know where we're going to do it, but we're going to do it. So, just hang in there. Also, the next Sims video will be on Sims Medieval, so there's also that. Alright, bye. so bad.